my name is Thomas Savadea. I'm working for SGS Life Science Services in Berlin. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about our experiences in the determination of elemental impurities according to the latest approaches from EP and USP. Just to have a quick overview of what I'm planning to talk to about today, um, there are many presentations at the moment going on in magazines, in webinars, and my approach will be to take a closer look what has to be done in the lab. So, I like to talk about quadrupolar ICPMS. I like to talk about classifications of interferences because ICPMS always goes with interferences. It's a big topic. What's currently in pharmacopoeias? And I'd like to show you a combined example of a testing for USP compliance and EP compliance in a single run. And of course, we expect interferences on our target elements. And this is what I'd like to show you. First of all, when we're talking about quadrupole ICPMS, all instruments come with the same comparable setup. We have to get our solid, uh, solid sample into a liquid form. We transfer it into the spray chamber. We generate using argon and aerosol and transfer it into the plasma. The pl plasma itself has about five to 10,000 degrees and we generate positively charged ions which will be forced into the vacuum chamber by an ion beam and we separate the isotopes um, by the quadrupole and at the end the detector is able to determine every single ion hit that comes from the sample itself. Like all instruments, an ICP has a plus and a minus. We have a huge dynamic working range. This is typical for an ICP also for ICP OAS, we can start at uh, sub nanogram per liter level and we can go up to the gram per liter level. But from my experiences, I would never, never do a gram per liter level because I would always end at the milligram per liter level to avoid contaminations or carryover effects. Fast multi-element multi analysis, of course. We have the ability to perform screening methods in our lab in Berlin. We do 72 elements in a single shot. And we have compared to an ICP OAS pretty good detection limits. A race car like an ICP has to be tuned and optimized on a daily basis. As I told you before, we have a lot of interferences and all instruments are sensible against salt concentrations in our sample solutions more than 0.2%. And of course, an ICPMS is an expensive toy. We have two times the price of an ICP OAS or three or four times the price of an AAS. Okay, first of all, we have to show that our instrument is, a, is in a good condition. We like to show in a daily performance check the maximum signal for our analytes. And on the other hand, we like to show the minimal level of interferences. So we track the oxide interference which comes automatically from our sample solution and we uh, track the double charged ions and for that we choose ser and barium because these two elements are the elements that form this kind of interference in the easiest way. Let's take a look at the table of elements. We have to know that we have different abundances in, in the isotopes. We have isotopes like, um, oh, I'm sorry, we have elements like arsenic, phosphorus, sodium, which are monoisotopic. Uh, that means we have only one isotope for the determination. And on the other side, we have elements like cadmium, mercury, which come up with uh, eight or nine elements. Um, <laughs> isotopes, I'm sorry. Okay. I'd like to classify five different categories of interferences. Um, those two kinds, physical and chemical interferences, show up before the sample arrives in the plasma. To get rid of physical interferences, we improve our sample preparation, we perform a dilution step, we use internal standards, and to avoid chemical interferences, um, we improve our method and we do stabilization. Um, I will come back to this point later because osmium and mercury um, come with some pretty nice chemical interferences. 
Um, spectral interferences, we take care of those in our daily setup procedure. We optimize our system. Uh, isobar interferences are typical for quadrupolar ICPMS due to the resolution of 0.7 atomic mass units. That means some elements share the same isotope mass. So we have the opportunity to use a corrective equation or we can, can choose an um, isotope that is not interfered. And at the end, a polygatomic interference due to argon species in the vacuum chamber can be reduced by using a dynamic reaction cell. Some instruments come with a collision cell. There are many expressions on the market, but in the end, they all remove the interference from argon species. In our lab in Berlin, we use um, ammonia and oxygen for that. Just a quick summary. Um, it's good to know that we have the top of the ladder when it comes to interferences at mass 80. That will be selenium uh, due to compounds of argon species. And many interferences have an end at a concentration of 20 microgram per liter. Okay, what's currently in pharmacopoeia? Um, it's still a limit test based on metal sulfides. Um, both pharmacopoeias, EP and USP, provided instrumental procedures there, but uh, they are deferred at the moment. Uh, the USP provided um, a chart a few years ago. USP 231 compared with the modern ICP result, and we can see that we have serious problems uh, when it comes to the limit test. We have um, problems with the recoveries and, of course, selectivity. Um, in this slide, I'd like to show you a quick overview of what's currently in EP and USP. Um, we have uh, still the limit test. We have USP 232 and EP 520. Um, they have different classifications in the toxicity. And USP comes with the addition of um, the big four elements and EP with manganese, iron, and zinc compared to USP. So this is a total of 18 elements for our example later on. Um, both pharmacopoeias chapters are deferred at the moment. That means the last approach came from the ICH in July this year, the Q3D Step 2B paper. Uh, and it comes with the addition of six elements compared to EP and USP. Okay, uh, I've chosen a pretty tricky um, sample material for our experiment. Uh, we consider a daily dose of not more than 10 grams per day in a parental dosage form. And we combine the worst case limits from EP and USP in one experiment and we do also a spiking experiment for that. So we start with arsenic and mercury at a low concentration of 0.15 ppm and we will the top will be iron and zinc at 130 ppm. So we have three choices when it comes to the sample preparation. The first and easiest step would be a direct aqueous solution we can use water or diluted acid, but we have to consider the total, um, total dissolved sample less than 0.2%. An organic solution, I wouldn't prefer that because we need a totally different instrument setup that means um, compared to an aqueous solution. And at the end, a closed vessel microwave digestion would be the final step to get any kind of solid material into a liquid form. Um, these are a few pictures of a digestion. In our lab in Berlin, we use uh, quartz vessels. They are made of a special bulletproof quartz material. Uh, we use 200, 250 milligrams of sample with nitric acid. And we have two thresholds for the, um, for the um, um, digestion. One will be the pressure at 80 bar and the other will be the temperature at 280 degrees. In times when we're using nitric acid, we will reach the 80 bar, and the temperature will be about 200, 220 degrees. In the middle, we can see a typical picture of an um, digestion. Um, we have this 
blue to green colored solution and a lot of nitrous fumes and we transfer it into a flask and we fill it up and we are good to go. We have a clear sample solution. What are the expected interferences in our experiment? We have to use an in internal standard all the time. That's, it's absolutely necessary for ICPMS. Um, indium is a good choice for that because it's not a target element. And we um, have two serious chemical interferences. Um, the number one would be osmium, because osmium will form osmium tetroxide in our microwave digestion. And osmium tetroxide shows enhanced nebulization efficiency in the spray chamber. That means we will achieve a 10 times higher signal compared to the same concentration of osmium just in a hydrochloric acid, for example. So we always will achieve false positive results. And for that, we have to do the same procedure for our sample material to our osmium standard solution. That means we have to digest all the standards. Um, mercury shows uh, absorption effects on plastic surfaces. That means in tubings and in our sample cups. Um, and to preserve mercury concentrations less than 10 microgram per liter, we have to add a gold standard and we're good to go for that. We have serious um, polyatomic interferences from our sample itself, from the chlorine in the sample, um, due to argon species in the combination of chlorine. And we have a really low target limit for arsenic, so we will expect very false positive uh, results for that. So we use our DSC, we add oxygen into the vacuum chamber and we transfer the arsenic to mass 91 in a polyatomic combination with oxygen. The same will work for vanadium, but in vanadium the target limit is not that low as for arsenic. This is a chart of an, the, the regression of arsenic just in water on the left. And in the middle, we have the same concentration in hydrochloric acid. And I wanted to show you what this uh, interference from arsenic will cause, because we have a huge background from the argon species, and on top of that, a terrible regression. And when we're using our DRC, um, arsenic transferred to mass 91, we're good to go. We have a nice regression again, and we can reduce the interference from the chlorine in the sample. We have to perform a um, standard stock solution. We use standards in a concentration of 1,000 milligram per liter. And we dilute this uh, standard material into a mixed, form, mixed concentration. And all standards have to be traceable to NIST. This is what the USP requires. And we do it in two steps. And standard solution B will just be for osmium. We perform the closed vessel microwave digestion for the osmium standard, and after that we combine both um, standard solutions, and we have one final standard solution for all elements. This is what a um, generic sequence for a method setup would look like. We calibrate in two standards. Standard one will be the half concentration of the target limit, and standard two will be the two times the target limit. And after that, we would measure a QC standard. I would always prefer um, to use an independent source for this standard to show that the standardization is correct and we don't have any pipetting errors or um, drift during our measurement. The reagent blank has to be performed in the same way as the sample, and we do the spiking experiment before the digestion. And as an, as an accept, acceptance criteria, we take the validation uh, criteria from EP and USP. They all come with 70 to 150% recovery. Um, at the end, we can calculate for LQ in our experiment in times where, when we are determined six times the reagent blank. And f over the 10 times standard deviation, we can calculate for LQ. And at the end, QC standard again to show that we don't have any drift in our sequence. Let's take a look at the result. We have in the third column a 
typical regression for an ICP. Um, we have LOD and LOQ, and between LOQ and the target limit of J, there's a lot of space. So um, we can also see that our major interferences on arsenic, mercury, and osmium. Um, we can show that the real arsenic value is below LOQ. We can reduce the interference from the chloride in the sample solution. The same is for vanadium. And when we consider the um, acceptance criteria, we have a variety of about plus minus 10% in the spiking experiment. I think this is a pretty good result and we can show compliance to the regulations from EP and USP to our, sample solu to our uh, ketamine hydrochloride. Okay, SGS as a QC um, lab, um, what can we do for you? When it comes to the determination of elemental impurities, we have all kinds of equipment for that. And at the moment, we are operating seven ICPMS worldwide. Just to speak for our lab in Berlin, um, method development, uh, method validation, and verification of pharmacopoeia methods is our daily bread. This is what I'm doing all the time. Um, and I hope I could show you that we have great experiences in the determination of the target elements from EP and USP. It's good to know that we have also the um, opportunity to determine non-metals and anions by ICPMS. And we do a lot of extractable leachable studies um, in a combination with our lab in Taunusstein, close to Frankfurt. Uh, the colleagues, they uh, prepare the extracts and they send an aliquot to Berlin and we take care of the uh, elemental impurities by uh, screening. And we do a lot of um, testing for silicon oil traces uh, that will be extracted from, um, from um, siring surfaces and we do this by AAS. Okay, this is my card, my last slide. I thank you for your attention and I'm open for any questions. Thank you.